let's bring in our first panel. We have World Metaverse Council Chair Jane Thomason right here, and then David Trier, Professor of Practice at Imperial College Business School. Thank you both for joining us. It's great to be here. And I'm really excited. There we go, we got the excitement. All right, David, I'm gonna start off with you. When we talk about metaverse, there's a few different definitions. Tell us what metaverse means to you. Yeah, so I had to think this through carefully for my new book, Basic Metaverse, it's coming out in June. And what I landed on was something that other notable metaverse thought leaders like uh, Charlie Fink uh, agree with, which is that the metaverse is first person, it's immersive, it's persistent, meaning when you leave, you log out and come back in, your things are still there, and it's communal. And by this definition, we include Roblox, we include Fortnite, we include about half a billion people who are already in the metaverse. So it's important to know the metaverse is not just meta. I think that's an important differentiation to make. The metaverse isn't just meta megs. I know you have a hot take on how people define the metaverse. Sure, I think the biggest thing for me is that metaverse cannot be owned by any one company. We cannot have multiple metaverses, there's only one metaverse. The same way that um, you can have an audience, you can have a community and people confuse the two. I think you can have a virtual world and it's a perfectly acceptable and respectable um, thing to build, but it's not a metaverse. There's going to be only one metaverse that is interoperable across all virtual worlds. Jane, let us know uh, what the World Metaverse Council is doing and how you're thinking about the metaverse. Well, I'd like to just support that and say we're thinking about Web3 open metaverses, and again, that's not meta. And what we want to do is create a global distributed thought leadership network. We have already a thousand people across a hundred countries who are all working on different aspects of the metaverse. So we want to bring forward their work and we want to bring forward the thinking on the metaverse and share it with the world. David, the metaverse is not meta, but meta went out there and trademarked the name meta. They said they were building the metaverse. A lot of people think that what meta's mission is, is the metaverse. Do you think that this is good or bad for adoption of what we're talking about today? Well, on the one hand, let's not forget that meta is building one of the primary virtual reality headsets and platforms. So as a contributor to the hardware and the architecture to support the metaverse, um, they are integral to the ecosystem. Um, I am, and I've made this well known, I am not a fan of the privacy and data handling policies that Meta has taken towards its 2.5 billion users plus the billions more that they have shadow profiles on. So I'm, not, I'm very unhappy that they are seeking to be prominent in this area area, but they are supporting us with hardware, they're supporting us with important software that was used, among other things, for a, a major advance in healthcare with the separation of co-joined twins last year. The entire surgery was rehearsed in their virtual environment. So, so they're doing good things and bad things, and I hope they do more of the good things. When we talk about open metaverses and we talk about these global communities jumping into virtual worlds, how do we think about this from a regulatory perspective, Jane? Well, I think all of the issues that we have both with digital assets, because we haven't spoken about them, and with Web 2, we're going to have in Web 3, but we're probably going to have a whole lot of more acute issues because you're going to be collecting more and more personal data, not gaining consent. You're going to have these virtual worlds that exist outside of sovereign governments that somehow people have to figure out how to regulate. So I think all of the regulation problems we have, squared. We've seen governments get into metaverse. I believe Barbados last year said they're putting an embassy in the metaverse. David, do you think that introduces an extra layer of challenges for us if the governments are now hopping into virtual worlds? I think it's going to be a challenge for the governments simply because there's less control for them and there's the risk of either the technology breaking or them not having sophistication about how to interact with the platform and, and governments tend to uh, try to mitigate risk more than entrepreneurs do. Um, but to just build on, on Jane's prior point, um, governments do have an important role to play in supporting and making the metaverse safe because there are a number of risks that are emerging particularly when we bring in technologies like AI. So now deep fakes are easier to make. We put that into the metaverse, which is a more emotionally compelling platform, and the risk of things like romance scams and cyber fraud are exponentially increased. And government can help with consumer protection as much as it can with promoting innovation. 
How do you think we can do that when essentially governments have always been behind technology, right? Like technology and innovation always outpaces the understanding that the lawmakers have of that technology. So how can we ensure that on this big transition moment, we actually have thoughtful and educated lawmakers handling the issues? Yeah, well, I think Jane is actually helping lead that with the World Metaverse Council, so I'll defer and to her. That, I mean, that we have groups working on standards and regulation because we feel that, uh, as you say, governments and regulators don't have enough knowledge, and we want to develop and share that knowledge with them and make some suggestions about how they safely regulate Metaverse. So, And there's the Metaverse Safety Council. There's several Metaverse global groups developed up who are working on this now. So we're all trying and we all want to get their attention and education is a really important aspect. But the one thing I really wanted to emphasize is it's not just government services, it's things like health and education will be transformed by metaverse. And if governments can see the potential and the community can see the potential, then they're going to be much more interested in adopting it. And, and that's a recurring theme we've heard all week as we've been running a series of thought leadership convenings uh, around consensus. That, that there's a, a tremendous need for government education on Web3, on Metaverse, uh, on you know, core crypto. And, and so the, the community has a real opportunity to help lawmakers and policymakers be better informed about the decisions they're making. You both mentioned safety just a few questions ago. Do you think the laws from the real world should transition into the digital world? Okay, I think, I think they're questions because we don't have avatar laws in the real world. So for example, is my avatar subject to the laws of the real world? Is my avatar subject to the harassment laws or supported by the harassment laws in the real world? And the answer is I think the legal fraternity haven't caught up with that and we don't have a position on that. They're definitely things we need to look at and protection of children is a really big one as well. On the other hand, we can adapt existing laws around things like protection of children, uh, like prevention of fraud, uh, like ensuring that any of these platforms or access portals for the metaverse have appropriate cybersecurity. So, so there is a framework and there are ideas to borrow from that have been applied in other technology domains, but Web3 is very much not Web2. Web3 is decentralized. It's so it's a much different substrate that we're building on, and so it does need some uh, uh, unique approaches and knowledge. Megs, you're our money lady. You come from a VC background. Where's the money flowing when it comes to the metaverse? Well, right now, I think, again, because no one has a definition of a metaverse that can agree on, um, you can slice the market many different ways. Gaming has obviously been kind of the one area, whether Web 2 or Web 3, that people have been investing heavily in because it's actually the place that people want to hang out, right? Roblox has uh, millions of users. Fortnite has millions of users in a way that uh, in Web 3 right now, we are still trying to gain mainstream adoption and kind of mass adoption and, and usage on a regular basis. And I think that's really hard for investors, where on one hand we are investing and building for the future, but right now users are still haven't been very quick to embrace that, um, that technology and those products. So before we go, we have to talk about the users that Meg's brought up. There were some statistics that came out a while ago that showed dismal numbers in a few different metaverses. It was, it was under 100, they were very underwhelming. How do we get people in the metaverse? How do we make it something that's useful to people in their everyday lives? I want to take that, if I could, on two counts, because yesterday I was on the metaverse stage here at Consensus with Rush Universe, which is a Web3 metaverse game from India, and they have 500,000 monthly average users and their numbers are really going up. So I think we don't just want to look at the West, I think we need to look at uh, the East and the South to be able to see what's possible in terms of numbers. But the other thing is, we've just got to do something about the user experience. No one is going to be walking around with Oculus goggles in five years' time and no one is going to be having private keys and fiddling around with wallets in order to be able to access these metaverses. That's a big challenge to uptake, and we can address it. And just to build on Jane's point, so when I was re researching Basic Metaverse, my book, um, one of the things I discovered was you know, some of the metaverse platforms, like Star Citizen, have millions of people who have engaged even when in beta. So. Um, I've noticed a lot of reporting likes to emphasize the negative. Uh, and so, for example, one of these headlines about only 100 people showed up was because the reporter came to an event three hours before the event started and no one was there. The actual event had 50,000 people at it, but the headline was 100 people, it's a big
actual usage where people are beginning to embrace this new technology. Jane and David, thank you so much for joining me on the show here.